just to set the stage, set the context for what we're doing in the next few minutes. Number one, people wonder, do I need to be baptized to be saved? No, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. We choose to be baptized because we are saved. So you're going to hear from each of these five people today some wonderful testimonies of how, how God saved them and how he brought them to himself and how they put their faith in Jesus Christ by God's grace. And then, then they chose to be baptized. And we'll get into that when they come in and we talk about that. Second thing you might wonder as you're sitting there this morning is why do we do this? What's the deal with baptism? Well, here at Hackensack Gospel Church, we have two ordinances, we call them. One is communion, which the Lord Jesus told us that we should celebrate until he returns. And we'll be doing that next Sunday here in our church family. We also do baptism because Jesus said that we were supposed to go into all the world, discipling, leading people to him, and then baptizing everybody in his name until he comes again. So that's the two ordinances that we follow in, in our tradition, in our faith, here at Hackensack Gospel Church. So that's why we're doing baptism today. Um, you might have another question. Why doesn't our church, some of you probably come from these traditions, why doesn't our church baptize babies? Uh, we believe and we follow what we see in the New Testament record that Jesus adopted, uh, adopted. Jesus baptized people who were adults, believers, adult believers. So that's why we baptize people who are believers. And if you've been here long enough, you know that we dedicate infants. We dedicate babies to the Lord and we come up with the moms and their dads and, and we dedicate them to Christ. So that's, that's a very important part of what we do here. But we baptize adults. That's who we are. I'm going through this with you. Um, here's another one. Here's another good one. We went through this with all the folks who are being baptized. We had a wonderful class um, and there was a lot of good questions and a lot of good conversations. So they all know all these things already. They were very good. In fact, some of them know more than I do. Does baptism make me a member of Hackensack Gospel Church? No. It doesn't make you a member of Hackensack Gospel Church. It's just simply you wanting to let the people of Hackensack Gospel Church, the family members here, of your faith in Christ. So those are some of the background things that I wanted to um, just share with you before we baptize. And now we have five young people Please be inspired by our young people. Uh, I'll probably get a little emotional in doing some of this because this is the next generation of the Hackensack Gospel Church that you're going to see in the pool this morning. So we're going to invite Eunice and Somo to come down. You, Eunice is, I, I called her my little test puppy because we're testing the water together here. It's okay, right Eunice? We're good. Yeah, a little chilly, but it'll keep us awake, but we're, we're good. This is Eunice, and Eunice um, was one of the first people that came to me and wanted to know about being baptized. So I would like to just share with you a little bit about her testimony that she wrote up for us. Um, she became a Christian. Uh, she's been coming to church ever since she was a baby. Uh, she became a Christian when she was eight years old. Uh, her mom was reading a book about heaven. Now, how great is that? She's reading a book about heaven, and Eunice imagined herself in heaven, and she asked the great question, how do I get to heaven? And thankfully, her mom and her dad shared with her about putting her faith in Jesus Christ. And so now, no matter what, she's going to heaven. And she's been, she understands that Jesus had paid the price for her sins. So then we ask another question. We ask, why do you want to be baptized? That's a good question too, isn't it? Keep this in mind because I'm going to ask this to you when we're done with our baptisms. Eunice's answers were spot on. One, we baptize because it's an act of obedience. Eunice is following Jesus. Jesus was baptized, and so Eunice wants to be like Jesus, so she's being baptized. The second thing that we do about baptism is that it will please God. Isn't that a great answer? I'm baptizing Eunice this morning because she knows, she's here in the water with me, because she knows it will please her Heavenly Father. Doesn't get any better than that, does it, Eunice? Eunice, do you love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Yes. Yes. Do you want everyone here to know that you are a believer and a follower of Jesus? Yes. Do you want to live for Him all the days of your life? Yes. Great. 
So that is Eunice's profession of faith. And on, on the basis of her profession of faith, I would like to baptize you. And I'm baptizing you as a minister of the gospel. It's a great joy for me to do that. I'm baptizing you on the basis of God's word. And I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. between the Nodar children. <laughs> Carly's a little cold, it's a little, uh, but we share a secret, us three here, that I'm gonna share with you now. I, I said I was gonna do this, so they said I could do this. Usually the Van Dyke family vacations at the same time in Wildwood Crest as the Miller family does. So we're used to seeing each other in our swimming trunks and at the swimming pool, and I think the pool water is just about this Maybe it's a little warmer, but uh, we're used to hanging out in Wildwood together. Little did we know that one day we would be in the baptismal pool, right? And that I would be doing your baptism. That is, God is so great that I get to do that. So I'm very excited to do that. So Carly, we're going to ask you to stand over there. We're going to let your brother go first. Nico, you can have stand right here. Let me share a little bit about Nico's testimony. Nico came to know Christ when he was in kindergarten at Bergen County Christian Academy, probably known then as Hackensack Christian School. And they were all with Mrs. Zuber in the library, and they were talking, uh, Mrs. Zuber is one of the great evangelists in this church, and they were talking about salvation, and Nico decided that he wanted to be saved. So he asked Jesus into his heart on that very day, and Mrs. Zuber walked him through and prayed with him. and as he entered into a saving relationship with the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Nico had a very good, uh, interesting answer. He's a teenage guy. He's a freshman at Hawthorne Christian Academy now, so you have to listen to why he wants to be baptized. I want to be baptized because I didn't do it when I was little. I kind of wish he had done it when he was little because he's a big guy. Uh, I've recently been offered the opportunity. He heard about our baptism uh, service here, so he knew that it was a sign from God. I like that. It was a sign from God. And he said, this is a great way to seal the deal. Does that sound like a teenager? I don't know about the theology of that, but I think it's a great thing that a teenager would say as he begins his discipleship walk and as he wants to do all those things I just asked you. So that's Nico's testimony. Nico, you can write here and face that wall there, please. So Nico, you want... To love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Yes. Do you want to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Do you want all these folks out here, including your family that's smiling so widely at you, do you want them to know that you're a follower of Christ? Yes. Well, that's great. So it gives me a great pleasure, and I'm happy to baptize you as a minister of the gospel and on your profession of faith in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Carly, come on over. Oh, Nico left. Nico, you left your sister here. Come on back in here. I want you to stand there nice and wet and chilly while your sister gets baptized. Um, Carly's testimony, how I came to know Jesus as my Savior. While I was in my grandpa's car, that figures, you, most of you know Fred Miller, and my brother had already asked Jesus to be his Savior, so I said, I want to have Jesus come into my heart. Isn't that a wonderful thing to say? Her older brother, she saw his faith and she said, you know what, I want to be like you. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. So she did that. And that's how she came to know Jesus Christ as her Savior. My grandpa, Fred Miller, says it right here, actually walked me through the, and prayed with her and walked you through the steps of salvation. Right? You got a great grandpa. He's a good guy. You got a pretty good mom and grandma too. Why do you want to be baptized? She wants to be baptized because she feels it's important she thinks this is a, the next step for her in her Christian life, and she wants to continue to grow in her faith. She's a student at Bergen County Christian Academy. So, do you love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, soul, and mind? Yes. 
Do you want to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Do you want all these folks here at First Baptist and at Hackensack Gospel to know that you're a Christian? Yes. And your classmates and your neighbors and all those people too? Yep. Good. That's a great testimony. That's a great profession of faith. So, he gives me a great honor as a minister of the gospel, as one who follows the word of God, to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wow. Hi, Hannah. Hi. This is Hannah Jimenez. Wave to your family up there in the balcony. See, they always sit up there in the balcony. There they are. They're looking at you and waving. Um, Hannah wrote in her testimony that she was blessed to be raised in a Christian household. She saw through her family, God bless moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas for showing your faith to this next generation. Way to go. I'm really, really thankful and proud that you guys did that. She realized that she knew she was a sinner in looking at her family. She realized that she needed to be forgiven by God's grace. And so one day in Mrs. Brown's Sunday school class, Mrs. Brown, uh, Hannah prayed with you and she accepted Jesus as her savior. She's probably around seven years old, she thinks. She always knew she wanted to be baptized at a young age, and she knew that when she was being baptized here today that it would be a public promise. That's one of the things about baptism. It's public. She's, making, she's identifying, you know, we hear a lot about identity today, right? What do you identify as? This young lady is identifying as a follower of Jesus Christ right now, and I think that's really special. That's really cool. Now there's something else that's really cool that she put in, in her notes here. I just have to say it. She says she is a proud believer. Are you all proud believers? Hannah is a proud believer. And she knew she wanted to be baptized at a young age, but mostly she knew because she wanted to take a swim during a sermon. <laughs> so Hannah and I have an agreement. I'm gonna do a sermon on Jesus calming the sea. We're going to open the baptismal and she's going to be swimming in the baptismal while I'm preaching that sermon. She's home from college. She goes to college out in California and she wants you all to know um, that she wanted to follow the Lord Jesus in baptism. So that's a really wonderful thing. So Hannah, do you love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Yes. Good. Do you um, want to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Great. And you want all these folks and all the people out there in California and your college to know that you're a Christian? Yes. That's a great thing. And so I'm honored to baptize you, Hannah. And I'm, I'm honored because God's Word teaches it. And I'm honored because I'm a minister of the Gospel. And this is all about the Gospel. To baptize you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is Abby Uwe, and uh, Abby has a really great testimony that I'm going to uh, read a, a large parts of it to you. Um, Abby is a uh, little Miss First Baptist Church sometimes. Abby knows how to fill this baptismal tank. She knows where everything is in this whole complex and our whole campus, and she has been a tremendous uh, help to me in the transition and to us as a church in playing the keyboard and doing so many other things in the worship community, working with the kids, uh, serving in vacation Bible school. So she wrote, I grew up in a Christian home, and she was around three or four, and she asked her dad, how great is this? What do I have to do to be saved? That sounds like it's right out of the New Testament, doesn't it? Isn't that what the people asked Jesus? What do I need to do to be saved? And that was the start of her walk with God. And it is going stronger and stronger, but listen to her story. She said, I've been surrounded by God, I've gone to church for my entire life, and at some point it became routine. Okay? Listen, this is a high school girl talking to you about our Christian faith becoming routine. Uh, she would go to church on Sunday morning, go to church on Sunday night, go to Awana Wednesday night, and repeat it. And it was not until about eight, year old, eight years old when our, this church 
went through a split, went through hard times. And even at a young age, Abby witnessed what sin does to people and how it can wreck a church. But she also saw how God mended people and brought our church back together again. So as she's grown older, she's seen God do tremendous things. There's a great deal of wisdom in Abby's uh, testimony here. She's lived through these things in her family. But her faith, even though times are, st are tough, have still survived, and it taught me all about the ways in which God works. Someday God's going to use that in your life, Abby. After the church split, she didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew God was going to get us through. Does that sound like a woman of faith? You better believe it. Trusting God has not only been something very important in my life, but it was for my parents also. This is where the story gets interesting. For the longest time, my parents wanted a child, but they were unable to have one. So they prayed hard for a baby, but it didn't seem to be God's plan. Eventually, they looked for an alternative, which was adoption. Yay. According to my parents, there were many couples who wanted me. Now, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I, who wouldn't want Abby Uwe, you know, to be their child? So many people were vying for Abby as she was a little baby. And she said, my parents wrote a letter, and they prayed and prayed and prayed that it was God's will, and I would go to them, and guess what? I did. I put an exclamation point in there for you, Abby. When I first heard this story as an early teenager, it was a perfect reminder to me that life does not always go according to our plan. Amen? Life does not always go according to our plan. And when she looks back and when she faces struggles, it helps her to remember that God is in control. I've been a Christian for a long time. I'm still learning and I'm still growing in my walk with God every day. What a tremendous testimony. Thank you, Abby, for sharing that with us. So you want to love the Lord Jesus with all your heart. Yeah. And uh, you want to serve him all the days of your life. Yes. And you want all these folks smiling out here to believe that, follow yeah. that too. Good. So upon this year, confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm honored to baptize you according to God's word in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wasn't that great? It was fabulous, I thought. We have wonderful next generation people here in this church. We've been talking um, on Sunday mornings. Uh, Jonathan Minima was here last week. And he really had the nice sermon. I have the ugly sermon today. And it's kind of a strange thing to do after such a wonderful positive baptism, but I've got to do what I've got to do this morning. So I'll try to make it as positive as possible. Jonathan last week talked about all the good things, that, the qualities that people should have in appointing elders, you see in verse 5 there and all the qualities that they should have. That's what we want to be. That's what uh, your children mirrored and evidenced here in the baptismal pool this morning. But then Paul changes gears in verse 10, which is where we start in Titus 1. And he starts to write to, to Titus, who's on the island of Crete, um, about some of the false teachers and the false teaching that's going on there on the island of Crete. So I thought, you know, when we go to islands, it's usually a pretty nice thing, you know? We can go to Hawaii, we can go to uh, Jamaica, Bermuda, Bahamas, you know, the Beach Boy songs, and palm trees blowing, and you know, you're on the beach, and it's a wonderful thing. Put that all out of your mind now, because Crete wasn't like that. Crete was kind of a cesspool of really ugly people. Any Cretans here in the room this morning before I begin? Uh, Paul actually quotes in this letter, in the passage we're looking at just for these few minutes, he quotes from a Cretan uh, prophet, Epimenides. And he was a prophet on the island of Crete around 5 BC and 6 BC, and he was very highly revered. And if you look at the um, verse 12 there, it says, one of Crete's own prophets has said it. Hold on now. Cretans are liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. So that's what I told you. We're going from the good of last Sunday to the bad and the ugly. You like that movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? Well, how he gets the ugly today, he gets the bad today uh, that we have to talk about. There have been false teachers on this planet, in this world, since the Garden of Eden. Uh, Satan, I think, is probably the original false teacher. He's the one who came to Eve and Adam and whispered in their ear and 
and kind of trick them and the rest is history and so you walk through all the Old Testament you see all kinds of false prophets there um, you walk into the New Testament of the gospel Jesus con was continually contending with people who were giving bad messages preaching bad things and then of course Paul now in the New Testament church he's he's talking he's writing to Titus who's the pastor on the island of Crete and it's just loaded with false teaching. It's just loaded with false teachers. Now, I want to issue a disclaimer as we begin that I have never said that about Hackensack, okay? I never said that they were liars, evil brutes, or lazy gluttons, okay? I've never said that. I love you. I'm not talking about uh, that with you today. But Paul and the prophets and Titus must have been having a really hard time in reaching the people on Crete with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, why was that happening? Look at verse 10. We see a four there. And when you see a four there, it's kind of like a therefore. That means, hey, what came before this? Well, what came before this in the letter was you guys really need to be managing God's household. You must be blameless. You not be quick-tempered. Don't be drunk. Don't be violent. Don't pursue dishonest gain. Paul is saying, I need, you to, I need to boost you up because for there are many rebellious people. There are many rebellious people. They were on the island of Crete. Uh, they were in the Garden of Eden. Uh, they've been all over the place. And as I studied more and more for this today, I realized we are just swimming in false teachers. We are swimming today in our world in false teaching. And every, it seems like almost everyone I talk to comes to me with that kind of an idea, that kind of a, what's going on, Pastor? Well, everything is upside down. Everything is sideways. How come what's right is wrong? What's wrong is right? And, and there's a lot of false teaching that's going on out there in the world. So don't be dismayed. It's nothing new. It's been going on for a long time. But we do need to figure out what to do with this false teaching. It's critically important. That's why I'm so excited for the young people who are baptized today, and we need to pray for this generation of kids as they go into their colleges, into their high schools, you know, that they would be able to understand what false teaching looks like and what is a false teacher. And, and Paul's going to do a pretty good job here in this text. So look at what he says about them. There are many rebellious people. They, they reject authority. They reject the gospel. I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and that was our middle name, was, you know, reject authority, fight the man. Uh, uh, my generation is probably the one that got us into this mess, so we have to take credit for that, those of you who are my age. But they just reject everything. And maybe you're familiar with a, a movie, um, Rebel Without a Cause. Anyone ever hear of that movie? The old 1955 movie. It was... It, was, it came out, it was, it was released to the theaters within weeks or a couple months of James Dean getting killed in his sports car on the cliffs of uh, California there. It was a very dark movie. It was a coming of age movie of teenagers in the 50s who were kind of violent, who were liars, who were getting into all kinds of trouble. Uh, and it, was a, it won a lot of awards, but it's sort of what's going on now, again today. It's, it's what's happening in our culture today. And, and they were just full of meaningless talk. They were full of deception. Look at it right out of the scriptures. It sounds like the script from, you know, Rubble Without a Cause, especially those of the circumcision group. And verse 11, Paul says, this is what we need to do. They must be silenced. It's a sharp rebuke. It's a stern rebuke that he gives there. The word there in the Greek means they must be muzzled like a horse, we have to gag them, these false teachers. Now, why do we do that? I thought, you know, muzzled and gagged, you know, the, the operative term we use today in, in social media is that they need to be canceled. You know, we get canceled for saying something out of the Bible. We need to be working on canceling some of these folks and the words that they're saying, which are full of meaningless talk. They're full of deception. They are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. They're very seductive. They say things that sound kind of okay. They're kind of pleasing to our ears. 
and then they get us, and they disrupt us. And I can't tell you how many families I talk, I've talked to over the last couple of years where this, these kinds of ideas, these narratives, these agendas are really disrupting families. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you know that, you know, when I go to the picnic tomorrow that I can, can't talk about certain things, and my family is totally divided about this topic, and they're very disruptive, they're very divisive false teachers. That's one of the things that you can tell that they're a false teacher. And to add insult to injury, they're doing it for money. They're doing it to mo for money. And when I get upset or I start thinking about these ideas, my sons will always tell me that, Dad, you gotta follow the money. And a lot of times that's really true. When you follow the money, you'll see that these people are dishonest, they're lying, and they're in it just as Paul says to Titus here, they're in it for dishonest gain. So look down with me at verse, I gotta cut some things out here. Look down with me at verse 15 in this passage, okay? Let's look at verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, uh, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure, everything is off, everything's wrong. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted, and this is a very damaging verse here. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So these false teachers, they fail both the character and the conduct test. Because our conduct, we know, comes out of our character, right? Now I can, uh, just as we baptize today, so you know, we, we asked those big questions and the response was awesome. But if, if those students go to their schools tomorrow and start, you know, lying to their teachers or picking fights in gym class or something, th then it's all for naught. We can't have that. That's what the false teachers were doing. Sometimes it's what we do. Our character needs to match up with our conduct. The other way we've put it in, in our world is our walk and we, we talked about this in there, our walk needs to match our talk, right? It's easy for us to talk here on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock in this beautiful church in Hackensack, but what about tomorrow? You know, what about Memorial Day? What about Tuesday and Wednesday and work and school and all the places? Does our walk match our talk? Paul says that these people, these false teachers, they don't, they fail both. They fail the internal test, they fail the external test. They're always emphasizing the externals. And you know that within Christian circles, right? Well, he wears a tie to church. He only reads the King James Bible. Uh, he's there every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We have all those external things. And sometimes the internal is not good. And that's when we get mixed up as Christians. And that's when I have, we talk to people and we counsel and try to guide them because it's very dysfunctional when you're trying to be this straight, arrow, legalistic kind of Christian and then on the inside you're, you're not so good. We gotta take care of the inside first. That's how God changes lives, right? That's how he changed these, these young people's lives. You know, he, he, they visited, they saw his grace and they accepted his grace and they accepted him into their hearts. And then out of the heart, then the behavior comes. The false teachers, the rebels would say, if you look at that passage, they claim to know God. And we have to put no in quotes because they didn't know God. They, they didn't have a clue about God. They were just trying to trick people. Their actions would condemn them. That's a tough place to be, right? When your actions speak louder than your words. Did your grandmother ever tell you that? Actions speak louder than words. And sometimes, you know, we as Christians have to be very aware of that. Watch what our actions look like. Our walk needs to match our talk. And these people, the false teachers, they were privileged insiders. So it's not like they were bad guys, bad men and women doing the false. They kind of moved into the churches and they infiltrated the churches. So at first glance, you look at them and say, hey, that guy's pretty cool. Hey, she's saying some really neat things. They, were, they infiltrated the church. That's what Paul got so upset with, and that's why he's writing this letter to Titus, because they were really messing with the church in Crete. And Paul finishes by saying, hey, they're detestable, which means they're horrifying kind of people. It's almost like you think that they're really nice, and then in the middle of the night you take the mask off, and it's like, ah, 
this isn't who I thought this was. They're disobedient, and the, another word for disobedient there in verse 16 is that they're um, insubordinate. They don't deal well with authority. And then the last one, he proclaims them as being unfit. Unfit for doing anything good. What a terrible thing to have to say about someone. You are unfit for doing anything good. That's the false teachers on Crete. So what do we do about that? What do we do about false teachers today? What do we do if you see yourself in some of those things? And maybe we need a little heads up here today too. Look back with me at verse um, 13, the end of verse 13. And here's our action point for this morning. Here's what we want to leave with. <clears throat> the end of verse 13 says, therefore, and you always know when there's a therefore, we want to make sure that, you know, that's an important word and that means something big is coming from something that just came before. And Paul writes and he says, therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. Pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. There's our talking points. There's our marching orders. Circle that verse. Highlight it in your Bible. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. When we come face to face with a false teacher or false teaching, it demands action. We can't just look the other way. We can't just walk away from it because it will infill our church, infiltrate our church, it'll infiltrate our families, and it will harm us. It will destroy us. It'll disrupt us. So, it demands action. What else does he say there? Rebuke them sharply. Another way they could say that is rebuke them, repute them, convict them. Do we know the word of God enough to say, you know what, what you're teaching comes right out of, you know, humanism, right out of Marxism. It doesn't come out of the word of God. Here's what God's word says, and we can refute what they're saying. And then he finishes by our, you know, our last word thing there is to pay no mind. I like that word. It's kind of like an old southern phrase. Pay no mind to those folks. Pay no mind. Don't pay any attention to them. These people are shady. They're shifty. They're seductive. They know what they're doing. They come dressed as an angel of light. And when you take the mask off, it's horrifying. So we need to be on guard. We need to be watching out for these kinds of ideas. They're all over our college campuses. They're all over our high schools. They're all over our culture. They're all over your computer, your phone, your TV. They're all in there. And you need to be able to discern those false teachings. And when you discern them, don't pay any mind to them. Don't pay attention to them. Don't get all caught up in it. Don't get lost in it. Don't pay attention to it, he says. Don't pay any mind. Because these are human ideas. They're not God's ideas. They're human ideas. And those human ideas reject God's truth. And we don't want to reject God's truth. So if we can do that, look at what happens at the end of verse 13. And this is where, this is where we want to be. If we can rebuke them, if we can pay no attention to them, then we become people who are sound in our faith. Would you like to be sound in your faith today? Isn't that a great, a great goal for us? Go in peace and be sound in your faith. It means to be in good health. How's your spiritual health this morning? How's your spiritual health? We were um, confronted with some wonderful testimonies today. How's your spiritual health? Is there some things that need to be addressed in your life? that need to be prayed over, that need to be talked about? Are you in sound spiritual health? Are you in good health? Or you did, do you need to see the doctor? Do you need to see the great physician? Do you need a physical? Do you need to kind of have an examination of your life? That's what Paul is teaching Titus, and he's teaching the Cretan church. He's saying, look, you want to be in sound faith? These are the things you do. Demand action. Rebuke the false teachers. Don't pay any attention to them. Go for the faith. Go for the faith that is centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I love baptisms. Because baptisms are pure and simple, centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's basic. There's no, no other stuff. There's no fluff. It's basic truth of God's word. Be centered in the truth of the gospel. 
That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for you this morning. As we are bombarded with these ideas and these messages from false teachers, let's get back to the book. Let's get back to church. Let's get in some Bible studies and let's be sound in our faith. Okay, let's be centered in the gospel. That's the best place to be. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these instructions that you gave to your apostle Paul and then he passed them along to his friend Titus, his pastor friend there on the island of Crete. And Lord, it, it seems like this letter, I'm sure as we go through, is going to seem like it was written to us today in 2023. So I pray that you would give us a little insight into what Paul's teaching. Um, by your Holy Spirit, help us to understand ideas that are harmful and disruptive and horrifying. Um, may we be discerning to see your truth, your gospel truth. We thank you again for the those who were baptized this morning for this service. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know, who doesn't have a personal relationship with you, with your son, uh, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. And Lord, if there are any who are uh, thinking about following you in baptism, we ask that you would continue to stir their hearts and that we might be able to do that too. Thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you for those who served so that we can share this freedom here in Hackensack this morning. Pray your blessing on us as we go. In Jesus' name alone, amen.